meant to set out how the SNP would plot a path to independence. Well, heckling is probably the least of his worries, with the party still mired in chaos following financial scandals and arrests, including that of his predecessor, Nicola Sturgeon. Oh, and the polls are looking pretty grim for the party that has dominated Scottish politics for so long. Well, I'm joined now by the First Minister, Hamza Youssef. Good morning, Mr Youssef. Joining us from Good morning. Dundee. And just as per your introduction, it's probably worth me saying that in virtually every single poll that has come out, of course, we still continue to be the party that leads every single other party uh, in Scotland. But I just thought I'd just uh, throw that in there, given your a very kind introduction uh, of me. Well, kind of you to fill us in on that. But let's, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, you said yesterday that you would make the next general election a referendum on independence. Does that mean that, as your predecessor clarified, that if you got 50% of the vote, you would consider that a mandate for independence? But would it also mean that if you didn't get 50%, you just drop it? First of all, it's not what I said, so I'll, I'll clarify in a second. It's worth reminding people that, of course, our preferred option, the option for which we have multiple mandates for, the option which the majority of the Scottish Parliament backs, uh, is, of course, for that legally binding referendum. Now, that has been denied time and time again by the UK government. So my message is pretty simple. Uh, we will use the next general election to test the proposition. We'll put a very simple proposition to the people of Scotland on page one, line one of our manifesto, a vote for the SNP is a vote for Scotland to become an independent country. Now, if we win that general election, we'll then seek to negotiate with the UK government how we give democratic effect to that proposition. And we're only going down this route, of course, because I continue to reiterate, because the UK government, Westminster but, parties, continue to deny us the right to a referendum. But, 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 so forgive me for interrupting you. When, when you say, if we win that general election, what does that constitute? Does that mean most seats in Scotland? Does that mean 50% of the vote? What does winning well, the general election sure, mean? Sure, I'm happy... I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to clarify, but I suspect uh, you have covered more general elections than I have even been involved in campaigning. In every single general election, everybody knows the rules of a general election. The party that wins the most seats wins the general election. So, again, if you want to test a proposition for popular support, which is a fair enough ask to do, in fact, it's what we want to do. If you want to test a proposition for popular support, you do that via referendum. That's no different to any democratic country in the world that wants to test a proposition for popular support. But the rules of a general election are thus, that, of course, the, the, the party that wins the most seats wins that general election. OK, so if you, win, if you win more seats than anybody else, you are going to take that as a mandate to push for a further uh, referendum. Now, both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer have said it doesn't really matter what comes out, you're not getting one. What, what are you going to do to force their hands? And, by the way, well, first it's and foremost, legal for them to say that. Well, first and foremost, I would put it to... Keir Starmer to Rishi Sunak, very simply, you continue to tell Scotland that this is a voluntary union, then prove it. If you're saying that you can't have your independence via a referendum, uh, I'm afraid we will not accept uh, any uh, mandate that's given to you via a general election. This is a voluntary union. How on earth does Scotland become independent? But the question you ask is a very fair one. And the second part of my uh, speech, in fact, one of the main, uh, uh, main arguments that I was making to our activists and reminding our activist base of is that it's so important for us to ensure that we have a consistent majority supporting independence. So while, of course, we'll be campaigning in that general election, what we're doing right now is campaigning to sh make sure that we have that settled will, that consistent majority in Scotland that support independence, because it is the power of the people that I don't doubt will break Westminster's intransigence. Oh, if, if I can just get clear something here. I mean, we're talking about democracy. If um, uh, there's a general election and either Mr Sunak or uh, Sir Keir Starmer are in Downing Street, they will have gone to the country with a manifesto that says we are not going to have another referendum. They will have won. In what way is it not democratic for them to fulfil their mandate given to them by a, ref uh, a general election of the United Kingdom? Scotland's not independent yet. Well, there's two... two, two... 
Well, there's two points to make on that. Of course, if we beat Labour in Scotland, then, of course, we win the general election here in Scotland. If you are saying that Scotland can continue to be denied a referendum because they are outvoted by the fact that the rest of the UK have more seats, then I would say to you very gently that that is the democratic deficit which we are continuing to rail against, I'm afraid, because there is a deficit uh, in that regard. So you are, you are essentially saying unless the rest of the UK allows you to become independent, allows you to have a referendum, and that's the only way you can become independent. That, to me, doesn't sound like a voluntary union at all. OK. All right. Well, look, we, we could go on about that, but let, let's, let's go on to um, the circumstances uh, in which you govern. Um, perhaps the best way of persuading everybody that Scotland should be independent would be to have um, a brilliant performance by the SNP government in Scotland. So let's address a couple of issues which don't depend on Westminster's say-so for agreement. For example, the NHS. You were responsible for it in Scotland between May, tw 21st, uh, May 21 and March 1923. Now, the number of patients on waiting lists in Scotland is up to 780,000. There are over 18,000 people who died waiting for treatment, a rise of 39% compared with 2019. Um, it's not a stellar record, is it? Your, your suggestion that somehow that is unique to Scotland it would frankly I'm, I'm be not suggesting it's unique. I'm just saying NHS, it's not very good for Scotland. Well, it's the it's the it's the proposition. It's the proposition uh, that that is the premise that underlines your question. That would be absurd, of course, because a global pandemic, by its definition, has affected health services right across the world. The pandemic was the biggest shock that hit our NHS in its almost 75-year existence in terms of the NHS here in Scotland. We stand in a record that shows that Scotland's A&E departments are the best performing for well over seven years. In fact, in the winter that's just passed, there was only one nation in the UK that didn't lose a single day to strikes in the NHS. That was Scotland, of course, while I was uh, health secretary. And if, when it comes to those longest waits on the NHS, if you look at those people who've been waiting for over two years, we've made dramatic reductions when it's inpatients, outpatients, uh, or indeed for those that are waiting for diagnostic tests. So there are, uh, there are challenges with the NHS. I'm not going to pretend uh, otherwise, but that's undoubtedly been exacerbated by that global pandemic. But we're absolutely focused on making sure that we can recover our NHS and social care. And just on that point, you say it's not connected uh, to anything that Westminster does. Well, we all know that you don't recover your NHS without recovering your social care. One of the biggest challenges we have, of course, has been Brexit. If you ask anybody involved in social care, they will tell you how much of the workforce in social care we've yeah, lost I think, because I think of that we are hard wandering Brexit, a bit away which from, Scotland didn't vote we're, for. We're, we're wandering a bit away from your government's performance. It's still not better. Uh, it, it's not really. Well, let me, sorry, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't. I, I just vote, don't agree. If you want, if you want to talk, if you want to talk to, if you wanted to talk about the SNP's record, of course, there's a report out two weeks ago showing that because of our actions, an estimated 90,000 children will be lifted out of poverty. If you want to look at our record, an Ernst and Young report out just last week shows that Scotland uh, outpaces the rest of the UK and indeed Europe when it comes to foreign direct investment. You want to talk about our record, you've got the best performing uh, A&E departments in the entire UK. If you want to talk about our record, we have more young people okay. going to university from deprived areas in Scotland than ever before. I can go on and on and okay. on if you want, <laughs> well, but I, ultimately well, it is the well, let, let, verdict of the not, people let's not, and they keep let's trusting not. the SNP Nobody would government. say that you are responsible for some of the, uh, let's call them shenanigans, that have taken place in the party, but you have inherited uh, a situation which has damaged the SNP. Um, can I just get clear one thing? Um, are there any circumstances in which you would remove the whip from the MSP and former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon? I'm not going to get hypotheticals about what might happen in a live police investigation. You should know better than that, of course, that it's, it's, it's inappropriate for ministers, first ministers, any elected politician, uh, to, of course, comment on what is a live police investigation. Of I'm course, just asking if, have, if you can uh, imagine... I've made, it, I've made it... I'm not asking you what well, look, circumstances... I've, I've made it very, very, I'm just very asking clear. if you can imagine circumstances in which she would lose the whip. Again, uh, I'm, I'm not going to make this uh, about either Nicola Sturgeon or anybody else, but what I will say is those that have been released without charge have been consistent. They have not had the whip removed for them or their party membership suspended. Uh, we'll keep that situation uh, under review, but it is a live police investigation and one that I'm not keen to comment on for that very reason. 
You do accept, though, don't you, that this has been pretty catastrophic uh, for your party. You're, you're the chief executive of the party arrested in April, um, missing 30,000 members, the pur purchase of a luxury motorhome worth £110,000. Um, did you know any of that when you stood for the leadership? Uh, no, and I made that clear uh, at the time. And, and look, I'm not going to argue with your central proposition. I mean, it's probably been the most difficult few months uh, of the party's uh, recent modern history. But I'm the leader and I've got to make sure I do everything I can to ensure that there's stability within the party, that we are open and transparent. That's why I instructed uh, a governance and financial uh, oversight, uh, financial review uh, as well. So the party is conducting that uh, at the moment. But it's also why it's important for me to galvanise our party, and that's why we had such a great convention here in the city of Dundee just uh, yesterday. So despite all those challenges, it's worth me reiterating oh. what I did at the very opening of the interview. We are still the most popular party in Scotland in virtually every single poll. And of course, we have by far uh, the most members than any other political party here in Scotland. Well, so that's a pretty good base to build upon. I, I just want to give you the opportunity to, to respond to what I think some people say you've been a very senior member of the SNP government for a long time, best part of a decade. It is hard to understand that you would not have any consciousness of any of these issues until after you became elected as the party's leader. You can understand why that seems it's bizarre to an outsider. Not really, because nobody's really asked that question before, because people generally tend to understand that you can be a senior member of the government. That doesn't mean you're a senior member necessarily of the party, because I've actually never had an office-bearing position uh, in the party and for all, almost 20 years that I've been involved in the party. I've had a number of uh, pretty tricky jobs that have kept me busy uh, in government, whether it was Transport Minister, Justice Secretary, or indeed uh, Health Secretary, as you just uh, alluded to a moment ago. So, uh, you know, I, I'll be upfront. You asked me a pretty straight question. Did I know about the various different issues uh, that you raised? Uh, before uh, they were made uh, public in the media? Uh, no, uh, the answer to that very simply is no. All right, one other thing which has caused you quite a lot of uh, trouble. Um, I know that uh, the Parliament has passed the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, but it is an extremely unpopular bill, according to polls in Scotland. Uh, barely one in five people uh, support it. Labour has said it won't support it. Tories have said they won't support it. Are you going to continue pushing for that through uh, legal action in courts? Well, first of all, let me correct your uh, assertion again, and, and this is really basic, actually, that, of course, the Labour Party did support the gender reform recognition bill, as did the Liberal Democrats, as did the Greens, uh, as did the SNP, and indeed some members of the Conservative Party. So we had members of every single party uh, supporting the gender rec for, uh, recognition reform uh, bill. Actually, this is okay. a pretty simple issue of democracy. Whether you agree with the substance of the GRR bill or not, we have a bill that's been passed by the majority of Parliament that is within our, our, our devolved competency, which has then been vetoed by a UK government. Uh, that, to me, is another example right. of a Westminster government that's looking and seeking to undermine devolution time and time again. All right, forgive me, I'm just interrupting you because uh, something has just landed, which I just want to ask you about. Um, it's the breaking news. Scotland Fire and Rescue is saying that alongside other services across the UK, the national 999 system is experiencing technical problems and they're urging people to phone other numbers. Um, your reaction, uh, how worrying is that as somebody who's been responsible for one of those emergency services and health and so on? That is, of course... Uh... Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.